Welcome to Tucson Bitcoin Podcast. Today, my guest is Santos Hernandez, and he is an awesome dude. He is a member of the Arizona Bitcoin Network, and a huge part of it. Uh, thought I'd get him on. The other night, we were playing CSGO for a couple hours uh, using Zebedee's in Fuse, so we were able to load some Bitcoin into the game. And, you know, if you're good like him, win a little bit of rewards. If you're terrible like me, uh, well, fortunately, the fee to enter was covered by Bitstamp. That was a pretty cool event to do. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun playing a little bit of CSGO with, uh, you know, Bitcoin integrated into it. But yeah, I thought I'd get him on the podcast. We had a great conversation when we were doing that. You know, just talking about Bitcoin and markets and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And this was a great conversation as we got into how Bitcoin changes, you know, the psychology the way you live, it changes your perspective on the world and, you know, on polit- politics and all these other issues, you know, for the better, in our opinions. Um, and I hope you enjoy this. All right. And we're recording. Good to have you on, Santos. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. Yeah. You're becoming, you know, a really strong part of our uh, Arizona Bitcoin scene. It's really awesome. Um, But yeah, you uh, recently made a decision to go work in Bitcoin world and to get out of the fiat world. Uh, Yeah. How's that feel to be done with that? Feels awesome, honestly. Um, Friday was my last day starting Monday, but I actually kind of officially started, you know, at the Bitcoin 2021 conference. So it feels wonderful. Didn't even feel like work. I was there for like, I don't know, 10 or 11 hours. (laughs) <laughs> I just did what I normally do, talk about Bitcoin, talk about gaming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like the best deal ever. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, Zebedee is a cool company. I, I've, we, we were playing CSGO for a couple hours last night, or it's not last night, last weekend, and uh, last week, I, I can't remember days. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, either they just blend together at this point. Yeah. For me, it's a good way to just throw my money away. Um, I'm so bad at video games, but <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, now there's you know quite a few sponsored servers, so you can go and you know practice. I plan to write a guide how to like skill up too. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, you had an opportunity to uh, orange pill some of your uh, American Express coworkers. Uh, what was that like? It was really cool, honestly. Um, you know, I've been working at American Express for like two years, you know, before leaving. Uh, and I've been in the lot, my last role for like a year. So I've done a lot of things, you know, I built a lot of applications and stuff. So I built trust and d- did good work. So my coworkers trust me. Um, they know how I am, that I'm always learning and everything. So Friday, uh, we usually do like a knowledge share. And uh, they happen to throw a surprise party and they ask me, you know, where I was going. And I explained, I'm going to a Bitcoin company and then all like basically all questions popped off. I was able to like address like a lot of the energy FUD, how mining works, because that seems to be like a really common question. Why is it called mining? How does mining work? And, uh, you know, how does Bitcoin work in general? So most of them didn't knew of Bitcoin, but didn't really quite understand it. So having that opportunity to, you know, discuss with my old team who works, you know, in tech, you know, in data, financial system uh, was awesome. They they were very responsive to it. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just amazing to me how many people out there, especially in the traditional financial world, just have such a poor understanding of Bitcoin. Um, I mean, even, you know, this something I ran into is like, even people that are in the crypto space oftentimes have a very bad understanding of Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, if you're in the crypto space, you probably don't really understand Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt pretty bad, um, you know, looking at what Cardano is doing right now in Ethiopia, where they're partnering with the government to, you know, collect a bunch of data on people and put it on the blockchain. It's just super creepy. Um, it's, it's like they're helping create a social credit score in Ethiopia and, you know, Cardano is one of the first shit coins that I was really interested in and followed. Mm. And it, 
you know, it, it feels awful today to know that like I played a part in like funding that nightmare, um, for a short amount of time. Um, but really grateful for, you know, the Bitcoiners that helped me get out of that, sh- that bullshit. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's like, I, I think like seeing stuff like that really puts a fire under me. It's so much worse than just scamming people. Uh, the stuff that these, some of these shit coiners are doing because that's, you know, that part's like really destructive. It's just like misleading people and, you know, printing money and, um, scamming them, but actually to implement like really destructive things that are very, very against human freedom is awful. Um, and crazy but yeah yeah i think you know um we've all been in shit coins at some point at least most of us and we kind of learn through pain you know that shit coins are definitely not the answer for me was eos like i had i was into bitcoin and then i got into eos like i saw it as like not replacing bitcoin but to help you know crypto quote unquote scale and you know it wasn't until i actually tried running the software I realized like how broken like the scripts are don't work like synchronizing uh, the blockchain didn't work and then once I actually went further deeper down the rabbit hole it didn't even make sense to have a blockchain because if you only have 10 nodes you know controlling the entire network what do you need a blockchain for just you know like make it a closed network at that point so yeah I, I think you know all the things that you're doing for Bitcoin uh, greatly outweigh the the negative of you know uh cardano or like yellow says cordano <laughs> uh, so. yeah yeah i mean it's just i think like the biggest thing that bitcoin has taught me is just really having to weigh um the impacts of my actions on the world and like seeing how destructive you know participating in the fiat system is in general and like shilling these you know, nonsensical things. I, I mean, Jimmy Song talked about this, like, uh, you know, and this is kind of an extreme view, but just about how even like participating in taking out debt and loans by expanding the money supply is destructive and harmful. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I think it's like just in the world that we live today, it's impossible to do no harm. You know, we're just so interconnected in our actions. So, like, we're both using computers that, you know, have, you know, dark, um, uh, just darkness and, like, what it took to create them with, like, mining different uh, minerals and probably the Democratic Republic of the Congo with, like, slave labor and gangs and then, you know, potentially being made with, like, slave labor in, in China. And it's unfortunate that, like, that's like really you know the only options to like do these things is like we we are consistently doing harm um but i think like it's important to like do less harm or as least amount of harm as possible and participating in you know solution oriented things especially like you know with bitcoin we're moving further away from that system that is just so awful um and empowering individuals in these different areas like the Democratic Republic of Congo is has some pretty exciting uh, things around Bitcoin mining, um, and you know if they get a fraction of what's happening in El Zante, you know in El Salvador, there you know the people are going to be a million times better off, and they could potentially have stability with this currency that you know isn't subject to all the craziness. Um, of the fiat system, you know, to get away from the IMF and the world economic forum and, you know, the European union, the United States and China and all these com- countries that just want to extract as much as they can out of there. Um, so that gets me excited and, you know, it's, it's just tough, you know, when you look at it, like you can't really do anything without, um, you know, harming someone somewhere. And, but Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, to your point, um, it's good to minimize the harm that we do. It's com- it's impossible to avoid it at this point, at least the way that the world is set up right now. I think in the future, um, as people have, you know, more freedom, people acquire more wealth, especially like number go up technology. 
um, perhaps they won't have to be subjected to like a authoritarian government. So, you know, uh, countless countries have tried to ban Bitcoin uh, multiple times and still citizens like in Nigeria, as an example, find a way to continue using Bitcoin and uh, it didn't really matter what their government said. So I, I only hope that that continues to take place in many places of the world, especially areas that rely upon slave labor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I mean, like one of the biggest thing, have you ever read the book, Why Nations Fail? No. Mm -mm. It's a really fun one. Um, it, it talks about Nogales, Arizona, which is like in my backyard practically. So I kind of like that. Um, yeah. But I mean, it talks about like the importance of the need to, you know, have access to financial services. That doesn't necessarily, I think today mean banking, but like the ability to save money and store it um, is huge. And, and that's a big part of, you know, why nations like either fail or succeed. And a lot of these countries, developing countries, like people just don't have any ability to save money. You know, and then on top of that, like a lot of them are relying on remittances of sort, sorts and the uh, middleman or the gatekeepers just take so much money away from these people. Um, and Bitcoin changes that from a peer to peer basis of like, we don't need payment processors anymore. We don't need middlemen. And you can securely store your money on a smartphone, which are becoming way more accessible to people in these countries. It's just absolutely incredible. Big game changer. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. I think also like you know, my we talked about this a little bit last week. My grandfather uh, on my dad's side came here when he was just you know a boy. He was a teenager. His parents both died, and they they walked to Arizona, you know, from uh, like central Mexico, working on farms each day. His brother died of dehydration, so it's like you know, it's no trivial matter to pursue like better economic opportunity and the risk that it imposes and imposes and and that's largely because you know of inflationary fiat currency not having the ability to save the incentives are warped uh not nearly enough like development job creation and those people that are willing to take that sort of risk are the very people that you probably would want to keep as as a nation state because they're going to take those risks create new jobs and most people that I know, um, you know, they they love their homeland. Like, for example, a lot of people I know from Mexico love Mexico. They miss it there. They miss the culture, you know. And now, you know, they won't have to take that sort of risk if they have that fundamental human right, which is to, you know, save their energy without it being diluted by a third party. Then they don't have to take that sort of life changing risk, risk dying, and also they can stay where they want to stay, ultimately have more freedom in that sense. So I, I see that as a tremendous positive, you know, for, for um, nation states that adopt the Bitcoin standard. Yeah. I love that story about your grandpa. I mean, it's just so powerful to hear, you know, stuff like that. And I mean, it's funny because the Biden Harris administration talks a lot about this like pull factor in the U S and that you have to change that pull factor. Um, and you know, as soon as El Salvador talked about going on a Bitcoin standard, what, what happened, <laughs> you know, the IMF and the, um, state department contact them. And they're like, Oh no, this is bad. You know, you guys can't do this. And it's like, it, it, tremendous uh, like remittances make up 22 percent of el salvador's gdp and a lot of that is you know taken and, and is a lot smaller because of the diff one the difficulty to send money there you know v via remittances and then two the fees that are associated with sending the money anywhere from like 10 to 50 percent um and that's not even and then you add the difficulty on it of like, you know, people having to travel to these brick and mortar places to like receive their money, sometimes traveling, you know, almost a full day to get there, to get this money. Um, and it's like, you want to eliminate the pull factor and like create an environment that is like stable for people to live in. Bitcoin is doing this um, just, just with the cross border and then not even talking about like the ability to save with the money that's not constantly being depreciated. And then, you know, like El Salvador is on the dollar. Um, and so all, all the moves that we make 
you know, with expanding the money supply and, and debasing the currency impacts them a hundred times worse because they don't get to just print money um, and throw it wherever they want. And it's just, just ludicrous to me. I mean, these people are just like, this is something that like people need to realize is like, we're lied to just blatantly and it's evil and it's awful. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like, I agree 100%. Yeah. But yeah. I love immigrants. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people that uh, migrate here start jobs. Like, you know, my wife, she's from Mexico. Her mom's from Mexico and um, they've never taken a dime of government money. They've in fact created um Originally, they, in 2011, they created a house cleaning business. They scaled, They literally went door to door, putting flyers up, created jobs for other people, and he uh, started a business from the ground up. Now, you know, Heidi's no longer involved in that, but um, her mom still runs the business, and they have over like 50 clients uh, that they service all throughout Arizona, work incredibly hard for their money, and yeah, it's been a net positive, you know. Uh, for them and, you know, creating jobs for other people. Same with my grandfather. He worked on farms when he got here um, and he eventually started a construction business uh, doing water pipe laying. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think that immigrants tend to have a, a lower time preference than people? Yeah. My, uh, my mother-in-law is a hardcore hodler. <laughs> so we orange filled her like a couple years ago. Um, and she pretty much, this is her first cycle. Excuse me, I had to clear my throat. This was her first, like, um, I guess, like, yeah, cycle and correction, you know, 50%. And she's been stacking all the way through. She kind of sees the long term value. She understands the value proposition. Um, and she understands that. You know, this is not something that you're going to hold for like a week or a month or a year. This is something you're going to hold for a minimum of like four to eight years um, and that this is generational wealth. So I think, you know, ingrained is to not be in debt and to save in many cases because yeah. you don't have access to credit like as an immigrant. You don't you're like, you know, you, you have to pretty much get like a TIN number you have to find a place that will even give you credit using a TIN number. It's kind of, you're kind of out, you're not, you don't have very much financial inclusion. So you have pretty much no way to save other than, um, or I guess to buy things other than to save is what I meant to say. And you also have to find ways to work with like the, your community uh, to save. Like they have these things called like lotteries and you can all pull your savings every week everyone contribute like 10 people contribute a hundred dollars and they'll do like a raffle to determine like who gets uh you know the savings next and they do that for 10 weeks so that way they have a possibility to get the money that they need faster and there's no bank or you know there's one person that's running it so there is a third party but it's usually someone that has a good reputation in the community interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just think of like the low tide preference it takes to like for your dad, for example, to like walk all the way, you know, from central. That's a pretty long way. It's a long ways to drive um, to walk there to go to another country. <laughs> probably probably what he was thinking is like, I want a, a better life for, you know, my future generations, um, you know, for my kids and grandkids. And that that yeah. low time preference. 100%. I mean, and because of him, I do have a much better life, you know? And and we can contrast that against like, you know, generations today that are, you know, worried about like TikTok followers and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God help me if, if I start wor ever worrying about TikTok followers, just fucking cancel me. <laughs> yeah. I refuse to get on there. Yeah. I've always hated social media, but I've kind of gotten sucked into it for the podcast. It's just, it's just like a cesspool of like nonsense. You, the, the amazing thing about Bitcoin Twitter though, is I, I feel like that is one place of lucidity, at, at least a little bit, <laughs> or kind of get sucked into, I mean, what, what the heck's happening with Breedlove right now? Have you been following him? 
Yeah, I think he just turned scammer, man. We've seen it before. Uh, I think it's really important not to make anybody in the space a hero. And uh, he has some really great chats with Sailor. And, you know, he has some really great chats with Jeff Booth. And they're great. But as soon as you start promoting shit coins and it's your, your acts, like, I don't, I, he's trying to double down in what he, what he said about BitClout and that he's just exploring, you know, the free market. And that's just a bunch of uh, BS, in my opinion. Like, if you don't spend like five minutes to understand what something is before promoting it to your thousands of followers and posting a link, then, you know, like, that's just kind of stupid. And this, you can obviously tell he's not stupid or ignorant. Um, so I think it was intentional that, you know, once you send Bitcoin into BitCloud, you can't get it out. And uh, to me, that's a blatant scam. So I don't know what in his right mind would cause him to promote that to his followers and claim to be a Bitcoin maximalist, if that's the case. And there's a lot of people that will like do the Fidity scamming, right? Say, oh, I'm a maximalist, but then have like some shit coins in their, their, their bio on Twitter and all that. So to me, um, he went from, you know, some people's heroes to zero really quick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's always a bummer to see that happen, but it also is like, it, it, I think drives in the point of how important plebs are, you know, people that are doing this like based on principles and it's, yeah, I mean, it's just awesome to see like this, uh, uh, immune system response to these guys that do this stupid stuff like that yeah absolutely i love plebs i'm a pleb myself so we should all strive to be plebs i mean it's like Agreed. The i mean i i tend to love things that are you know the polar opposite of like normal society so you know oftentimes in normal society you're you're working to get this reputation to be this you know, be put on a pedestal. Like that's what, what we're taught and worshiped like with, uh, um, celebrities or, you know, as Luke Radowski calls them, uh, celeb retards. I like that. <laughs> I yeah. love it. That's it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're ridiculous. Um, people in Hollywood, but, um, uh, celebrities, sports stars, um, uh, you know, and you see that kind of circle into Bitcoin, you know, it's like, okay, Rao Paul, macro, ex Goldman guy is now talking about Bitcoin. Everybody just get freaks out and loves him. And then, of course, he starts shilling X or shit coins like XRP and, and then he gets can you know, people freak out at him. Um, but I just think like normal like bitcoin is the polar opposite of that of like normal people are just as important if not more important than these influence these big people um that are super famous i mean it's it's fantastic it's i'm really attracted to things like that yeah absolutely i mean it's it's interesting when you have plebs like chaining or changing uh, a mining corporation like Mara, as an example, you know, trying to mine OFAC blocks, which is just ridiculous. And, uh, you know, plebs uh, being the immune system response pretty much bullied Mara into uh, removing the OFAC compliant, you know, compliance aspect of their, their blocks, made them signal for taproot, which is excellent. So it shows that, like you said, plebs are strong together. And they're definitely an immune system response to fight off the bullshit, ultimately, that people try and pull in the space or even organize groups. So I think uh, clubs are incredibly important. Yeah. And also a great aspect of the community. Like everybody talks about, you know, uh, toxicity and all of that on Bitcoin Twitter. But I'm part of a few club groups and they're some of the nicest people that I've met and, you know, I've, I've made some real friendships there, which is awesome. Yeah. I mean, like that's the toxicity. It's an intolerance of nonsense. That's what it is. It isn't yeah. about mean just to be mean. You know, if there was like a, a well-known nutritionist out there that started going on about, you know, how great Taco Bell is for <laughs> a healthy diet, you know, and the nutrition world would be tolerant, you know, is being tolerant saying, okay, 
you know, that's great. Or going after them and calling them out for that nonsense and saying, no, you know, Taco Bell is probably like the worst thing you could be putting in your body on a regular basis. And it's not conducive for healthy living. Like, and I see that it's like Bitcoin and shit coins, you know, it's like shilling Cardano, you know, a project that's like, you know, truly evil, you know, or Ethereum, which is just a fat joke. You know, they, they don't do anything of legitimacy over there. I mean, they, it'll be interesting, like, you know, experimentation, there might be things of value that come out there, but for like the new person coming in, you know, and shilling them a project that is just not sustainable and won't turn out to anything in the long run, it's just, they're going to get wrecked or Dogecoin. Dogecoin's like the worst of it all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Dogecoin, you know, being a meme, literally created as a meme with the exact opposite, um, you know, monetary uh, policy of Bitcoin and people adopting it like it's great for long term hodling is absurdity, pure absurdity. And that I, you know, this isn't my original thought, but I agree with the thought that that's more of a symptom of fiat money that, you know, for some people, Doge is a better store of value than fiat currency, which says a lot. And I think, you know, with respect to Ethereum, I think anything that the, the first principle, the first layer is flawed, meaning, you know, that one, it was pre-mined 70%, two, devs control it. So, and three, it's centralized. Not everybody can run a node, you know, it's on cloud hosted servers. Uh, and then it's only going to get worse as they move to proof of stake and basically become, you know, quote unquote, uh, not quote unquote, but they're going to be more like a central bank than a decentralized network. Basically, those who have the most control the network and validate things, which is, you know, goes against everything that Bitcoin stands for. So to me, like when your first principle, your first layer is flawed, the rest is flawed, no matter what you build on it. So that's why I think Lightning Network with respect to Bitcoin, one, you know, like you can test transactions, there's a lot of wallets and you, there are now wallets where you need no technical background to be able to store, uh, store send and receive um, SATs. So like that's an example of like the second layer that's built on a sound first layer. And because of that, we can trust that it works or we can minimize our trust rather. Yeah. I mean, the Lightning Network kills all the use cases for these shit coins. Like they're going to have to come up with like a whole new set of use cases and faster transactions. Yeah, I mean, you cannot ever argue that ever again. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because now you'll see people completely ignore the fact that Lightning exists and that it works. I mean, I think uh, if I recall correctly, Zebedee did over 30,000 lightning transactions just at the event alone and gave away over you know one bitcoin so it's like clearly like if it's stable enough to have all these people transacting on it at once and supporting all these transactions you know that's a clear indication that lightning's working look at all the work that strike is doing that that works flawlessly breeze i've used that app quite a bit that works uh great as well um so there's a tremendous support there's a ton of use cases for lightning um and basically like the fact that people just ignore the fact that it it exists is completely disingenuous and high signal that that person's probably a liar <laughs> and to ignore anything that they say yeah yeah i mean it's yeah it's ridiculous i mean lightning is like the most exciting thing happening right now in my opinion um just with i mean yeah, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin gaming, the implications that Lightning has on it. Um, so we were playing on CSGO. Uh, you load a wallet um, with with some Lightning. It's really easy to do if you have like Blue Wallet or Wallet Satoshi or any of those. Um, load up, a, you know, what was it, like 3,000 sats or something like that in the game? Um, so they're a sponsored server, so you can join uh, for free on uh, some of the servers like they'll pay like their their sponsors like bitstamp that will pay for your entrance so you actually don't need any sats to get started you can just join one of those servers and the sponsor will pay your entrance cost so you'll have 500 sats so you can join and you know have some fun kill some people in the game and die a couple times and try and stack some sats yeah so if you're if you're not terrible like me you can walk away with some money 
<laughs> yeah, if you're pretty good at the game, I mean, you can actually make enough money to, you know, stack enough to probably buy you some groceries, maybe buy a week's worth of groceries here in the U.S. And maybe in other places, it might pay for the full month. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, that's so like lucrative, especially outside of the United States when you're dealing with small amounts of money like that. Um, like look at Venezuela, for example, where people were mining, uh, or not mining, but playing RuneScape. And that was more lucrative than dealing with their fiat currency. Um, what, I, I mean, have you, has Zebedee seen any uh, uh, adoption in countries like that outside of the U.S.? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of Brazilian players for sure that we have Brazilian servers, but I don't have any statistics. Uh, I'm still pretty new, so I can't really say specifically uh, how much or, you know, which countries, but just based off of, you know, anecdote, anecdotal, anecdotal experience playing, uh, you know, infused with CSGO. Um, there's usually like quite a few Brazilian players that are in there, which, you know, makes sense. I think, you know, sats are probably better money uh, even right now um and what whatever they use in brazil so yeah yeah that's interesting i mean like the idea of like the sponsored rooms like that uh covering the entrance fee i think is so great um partly because like we we are not rewarded whatsoever for just being bombarded with advertisements yeah and it, it is an, an interesting way to to monetize it a little bit for the consumer uh and I think that's cool. <laughs> yeah, at least get something out of it. And some of the interesting aspects that I find like that really made me super interested in Zebedee was, you know, I grew up playing games. Uh, I played Counter-Strike, Source, Go, Starcraft, WoW. Um, and I'm sure some other games, uh, I'm just not remembering, but I was pretty good at those games. And at the time, you know, I was a teenager. There was no like way to monetize like playing those games, like X Fire streaming had just come out. Then it was just in TV, and uh, you know, like there was, it was very new. There wasn't a whole lot of ways to earn money for you know contributing value to the game or to your viewers, as an example. So now, like with Zebedee, I see it as an opportunity to where anybody in the world can you know be paid to play games because. Even in games, you know, you're contributing value. Like there's all these, like in World of Warcraft, there's a whole auction house economy and uh, people trade there. Like people will go and farm, spend time and farm these herbs and then create potions with them, put them on the auction house. And there's all this, you know, <laughs> undercutting and, you know, like strategy in terms of when to put them up on the auction house, how much to put them up for. Like one of my friends would do that and make, you know, literally millions of gold, which is an astronomical amount back in Wrath. Um, so now thinking about creating, replacing that virtual currency with SATs, which is the most sound money we've ever created and being able to see like people earning SATs for contributing the value in the game. And then if they're done with the game, like when I quit WoW, you know, all the hours that I invested, all the titles and stuff that I had, it's meaningless. I can't take it with me. But now imagine like you want to play a different game. Uh, like let's say you want to move into CSGO. Um, you can move it over and stake it. Or if you wanted to play, you know, if there's like ever an integration with like a farming based game, start off with X number of sats. Maybe there's some sort of limit and you'll be able to uh, take what value you contributed in one game and then move it into another game. Or just like have keep earning enough to be able to support yourself and your family, which for the average person, like hasn't been possible, which now is, you know, only the top, you know, 0.1% can really make a living um, playing games. You have to be either incredibly good or incredibly entertaining, which is really hard skill set for the average person to achieve because we just don't have time. I don't have time to play 12 hours a day anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We're if there's some boomers listening, they're probably pretty concerned right now. <laughs> yeah, video games all day. <laughs> yeah, I was always told I couldn't make money playing games all day, but I, if I would have stuck with it, I would probably be pretty well off. You know, I used to play in lands, and you know, everyone told me that wasn't like a viable career path, but now it definitely is. 
Yeah. I mean, we're really at an interesting turning point. You know, we're in the midst of this crazy industrial revolution and we see this very, very, um, you know, kind of awful centralization of things with Google and social media and, um, you know, the way the internet is run with censorship and things like that, that could be extremely harmful. Like they're pushing for vaccine passports and limiting people's travel, um, and tracking and databasing things. Um, and then we have a decentralized, uh, you know, movement going on this, this movement of, of freedom and autonomy and, um, sovereignty. Um, how, how does Bitcoin, you know, gaming fit into the world of sovereignty and not feed into, you know, this crazy centralized panopticon of evil, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So I think, you know, back in like 2011, you know, there's a screenshot of, a gaming tournament where the third place prize was 25 bitcoins right and uh, now that's like an astro astronomical amount of bitcoin you know like having 25 bitcoins makes you incredibly wealthy so i think you know if you're planning on like a four to eight year time scale maybe some people probably call me bullish for that or i mean bearish for that um i think like if you're stacking even like one to 2000 sats an hour, like if you have low enough time preference to hold on to that, you know, once we reach sat dollar parity, that will be a huge amount of wealth for people. And, you know, like it's possible clearly like, you know, each Bitcoin being worth like 37,000 USD now, um, you know, back in 2011, I think, what was it like 10,000 Bitcoins were equal to like $45 worth of pizza. So imagining, you know, that like each Bitcoin at the time was worth like probably the equivalent of what each Satoshi was is worth now. So to me, Satoshis are incredibly valuable by like 2025. I think like 95 percent of uh, Bitcoin supply will have been mined. And, uh, you know, that could be like a life changing amount of wealth for people in, you know, second and third world country, even here in, in, in the US, people don't have savings, you know what I mean? If you can, like, I love what Fold is doing, because you can stack sats, you know, while making your regular purchases. Now, when you game, you can stack sats while you game. And it's just going to help a larger distributed amount of people all over the world get access to the greatest money that has ever been created. And I think, you know, a lot of gamers don't even know what it is from what I've heard. They don't know what stats are or what Bitcoin is. So it, not only will it help them get sounder money, money that retains its value significantly better than their local fiat currency, it'll, I think, help orange pill a ton of people to then begin going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. What are stats? You know, <laughs> it asks those sort of fundamental questions that, uh, will hopefully lead to more people learning about what is money, you know, why do we have money, and uh, what is money's history, who is it controlled by, all of those fundamental questions that a Bitcoiner asks themselves. So I think it'll have, you know, just to kind of recap, uh, it'll distribute the soundest money ever created to more people all over the world to create a ton, uh, an enormous amount of wealth for them if they hold on to it, of course, and not spend it right away. And then three, it'll lead to a, a new class of Bitcoiners. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, this is like one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin is like, I, I mean, I just see like one of the biggest evils in, in the world today is centralized, central banks and the impact that, you know, fiat currencies have. And like all of this stuff that we see today with the centralization of every single industry and the collusion between them, you know, the endless wars, uh, the, you know, terrorism that larger companies perpetrate on smaller countries by going and, you know, destabilizing them and uh, extracting wealth away from them, from governments extracting wealth from their citizens in a very, you know, the very just awful way um are, is fixed with bitcoin they can't do this stuff with bitcoin with sound money with you know hard money um because it incentivizes like under hard money you have to produce value to do things you can't just extract it it's a lot more difficult to do that um i can't you know just print money to buy bombs to go destabilize and, and destroy 
another country. You know, it's a lot more expensive to do something like that. And uh, I mean, that's why I see Bitcoin as, as the you know alternative to that, as well as is you know the censorship resistance. Like, I, I mean, nobody can stop a transaction, and that's incredibly powerful. Um, that these governments might you know ban Bitcoin, but you can still log into Infuse and earn some sats on CS:GO. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. I think like the fact that, you know, no one has control over the the monetary policy, it's only ever going to be 21 million. And the fact that no one can ever change that is incredibly powerful. You can't censor those sort of transactions. It's unconfiscatable. So like you said, if they, if everyone begins operating under a Bitcoin standard, and uh, they want to fund wars and people only accept Bitcoin for payment or sats rather, uh, then they're going to have, they're going to have to raise the money and people have to voluntarily contribute to funding those sort of things, which, you know, then you'll have a better understanding of where your sats are being allocated, what they're being used for, and ultimately have a voluntary choice instead of just being taxed, have no idea where, where this money is going. You know what I mean? Like, I think one taxation is theft in general, like just because like there's a government in the middle between you, someone, you and someone else redistributing your wealth or using it for nefarious purposes, you know, that doesn't make it okay. And two, I think like, I I would be willing to voluntarily contribute to something that would improve, you know, my local community. I'd be happy to contribute something towards that. But the ultimate difference is like, that would be my choice rather than being forced into doing it. Because if I don't pay taxes, obviously I'll go to jail and uh, I don't want to go to jail. So, you know, it's like they're using violence to, to extract money from me to use it for whatever purpose that they deem it suitable for. And I have absolutely no control over that. So, you know, having like more of that sort of money and teaching people that sort of concept all over the world, especially in areas that, you know, are more authoritarian and uh, governments are more controlling, that they now have this freedom and power to be sovereign individuals that is incredibly powerful and a completely different shift in, in mindset. Yeah. Uh, I want to say this too, is I've been reading The Sovereign Individual and, uh, you know, initially it started off with uh agriculture right agri land was the first asset that produced yield and um with with that that created like incentives to to plunder those lands and that's kind of how states were created um basically organized violence to be able to extract yield from you know farmers basically so now we have an asset that can't be seized you know through means of violence or stolen yeah yeah, that's a great book, and I think it it's phenomenal for people to understand that. I mean, just like it, it does a great job of outlining the Catholic Church and the parallels of the you know the Catholic Church in the 1200, 1300s, um, up before you know the Reformation and um, the Enlightenment period, uh, and and the similarities that it has to our government today. I mean, like. There, there's this idea that is like talked about of like government legitimacy because of a social contract. And yeah, what, what if you don't agree with the social contract? You know, we're both talking, you know, I totally with you that taxation is theft, it's coercive, it, it, it breaks the non aggression principle um, 100%. And, you know, if I don't agree with it, then what's your choice? You know, it's like, I you you I I can give you two choices. You can go and shop at Walmart, or you know I'll put a gun to your head. Um, and is that really like you know a fair? You, you're going to make the decision to go shop at Walmart. You know, is, is is that like you know you expressing any sort of free will or agency, or is there you know manipulation there um, and coercion? Like it's it's. Um, and and people don't realize that there's a there's an option outside of this. I mean, you just look at the Catholic Church and and its control it had on, um, you know, governments and and on its people, and you know we look back at that and there was very obviously a different choice. You know that people could go and express themselves as they wanted. They could, um, you know, study science in, in a way that you know didn't agree with the church, like all of those things that were possible. I'm sure many of the people thought that 
those ideas were just as ludicrous as, you know, what we're talking about, this idea of a world without, um, you know, government coercion at the level. I, I think there will always be coercion, you know, in every society of some sorts. Like, that's just unfortunately part of human nature of wanting power and control over others, um, wanting to not work at the expense of others. Um, but when we, I think we can really, you know, limit it and lessen it and, and create place bastions of freedom, you know, that, and yeah, I mean, I, I am really, really rooting for El Salvador, uh, right now <laughs> and we'll see if they, I was talking with my, um, mom and stepdad about that and, you know, they, they were really excited about it. And I said, yeah, we'll, we'll see if, uh, um, you know, some crazy things like, uh, if they get, uh, destabilized, if there's an invasion of El Salvador, or, you know, and there's some sort of economic, uh, hit men that go in and destroy the country. <laughs> um, I hope not. Yeah. I really hope not. I hope they don't get sanctioned either. I mean, I think the key for their success is for other countries to do the same thing in tandem. And it sounds like there's a possibility for that to happen. Um, and I mean, it's just, if that whole region starts accepting Bitcoin, if there's like four or five countries that do it all simultaneously or, or really soon, I think they'll be okay. But yeah, I mean, those people at the IMF and at the Fed and, they're, they're truly evil people that don't do I mean, like Donald Trump was on the news the other day saying that he hated Bitcoin. They thought it was a scam. And then he said he didn't like it because it was competing with the dollar. And then like, you know, these other, I can't remember who it was. It might've been Yellen, you know, going and, and saying that Bitcoin kills the case for these retirement funds, trying to scare old people away from it. It's like, those are pre actually pretty powerful statements, you know, to suggest those things that Bitcoin is competitive with the world reserve currency. And then two that, you know, it could upend this awful, crazy Ponzi scheme, which is our retirement system. Um, <laughs> it's that powerful and they're that afraid of it. Yeah, I agree 100%. You know, thinking about like retirement, once I understood Bitcoin as like, money because i i first learned about it as technology and liberating yourself from banks you know um once i understood it as a money i was just like i don't need a 401k i could be it was an opportunity cost yeah i'm getting you know uh tax benefits yeah you know like um i get a company match but ultimately like if you think that you know 401k with the company match let's say like you get a 10 percent return on investment and you get a hundred percent match what is like 110 percent return well bitcoin's appreciating at 222 percent every year and i have full control over that money you know when you throw your money into a retirement account you have like no control over where it goes they have you know specific mutual funds that you can invest into they don't tell you what that mutual fund is composed of you're just throwing this money into a bunch of random companies or large corporations that you have really no idea about, or at least with, you know, uh, with, with SATs, I can say, okay, you know, I have control of this money. I have 100% custodianship of it. And there's no counterparty risk. It's the soundest money ever created. And I'm going to get a higher return on investment. Like, so the, the freedom factor plays into, you know, the cost for me, because I want freedom. And then two, the return, if you're looking at it from like, you know, an ROI perspective, Bitcoin kills it there too. So it's like, why would you want these sort of retirement funds? And I think it's so ridiculous, you know, like social security, like I, I really genuinely feel like we'll never see that sort of retirement. And then like the yield that we get on that for like retirement, the amount of money we get paid out is so low compared to if I could take that money and actually put it in Bitcoin rather than, you know, have it given to the government or I'll get like minimal yield. Like, I, I, I see that like significantly better. So, you know, to me, like even just holding it for four years is like um, someone that's older makes a lot of sense, you know, for one cycle. So for me, for me personally, I think that it's, it is the retirement option. It's the only option for retirement. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a crazy idea to, to take your money and put it in all of these crazy speculative you know, stocks and, and especially like when you look at how destructive wall street has been. And yeah. 
sector has been. It's just, it, it is so silly. And this is the thing that drives me crazy um, is people do not understand how much counterparty risk they're assuming with these different assets. And like Kevin O'Leary, I, I like almost, um, I, I almost just exploded when Kevin O'Leary was talking about like this idea of like clean mining and not wanting uh, blood money um, with Bitcoin. It's like th- this guy probably has so much money invested in China, you know, in in these you know con- companies that are just like funding totalitarianism and awfulness. Like I, I can't imagine like how much of a role he's played in that, um, let alone slave labor. Um, and he's gonna he's going to talk bad about Bitcoin. Like it's just, it's it's insane to me. Like, and that's, that's something that like, you know, I I don't think people realize is like when they're putting their money into these passive investments, like these 401ks that like, like I remember I had an acorns account a few years ago and I was looking at what was in it. And I'm pretty sure it was like companies like Tencent, which, you know, is like a, you know, crazy Chinese company that's propagandizing people with this awful CCP stuff all over the world, you know, and it's like, you can't, you don't have that control of where you're putting your money. Um, and it performs terribly, like paper towels perform better than S and P so far this year. Yeah. And that, that really shows you that there's something fundamentally wrong with fiat money. It's not depreciating fast enough. We need to we need to inflate these asset prices quicker. <laughs> yeah, well, there's six trillion dollars on the way. <laughs> so I know it's not funny, but it's just sad, you know. There's a, the only option for me is just to laugh, you know. As you could feel sad about that, but ultimately, I think it, it's a net positive. Like, yeah, if like uh, we become Weimar, or I guess when we become Weimar is a better statement. Um, there's going to be a lot of economic hardship, especially for people that, you know, are unprepared for such, such things. And that's sad. You know, I do feel sad for, for that, but at the same time, it's going to help like, you know, uh, as an example, by printing money and bailing out large corporations, like you're reducing pain, um, immediate pain, instead of letting these companies fail, and go under so that capital can be reallocated, new businesses can form, more efficient businesses can form. And, you know, basically the idea of creative destruction. And uh, I think the same thing is going to happen, you know, with Bitcoin. I feel like there needs to be creative destruction. Like this is going to be painful for a lot of people, but it's ultimately going to get us to a Bitcoin standard faster, more, you know, freedom, more power as an individual, which will be in the long run a great thing. So that's kind of how I see it. I feel like fiat money is completely messed up. It's going to probably suck for a lot of people for a pretty long time. But after we all adapt to a Bitcoin standard, uh, you know, it'll be much better than what it was before. Yeah. You ever been around someone detoxing off of drugs or alcohol? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I see it like as a similar con concept of like it's just this awful experience um to do it like you know say for heroin the the withdrawals can take a while um it could take a long while like it's really bad for like a week or two especially like when you don't do it with medical assistance um but i mean you know obviously like living with a heroin addiction uh can be pretty destructive same thing with alcohol like alcohol withdrawal is like deadly and it's pretty miserable at first you know but like people people get sober and clean to have a better life you know and you have to go through that process and the longer that you um refuse to do that or or kick the can down the road with addiction like one you know it's it just the more destruction you create in your life. And that's what we're doing with fiat currencies. It's going to be miserable. And like, you know, heroin addicts, it's, it's like one of the hardest things to quit. But, and, you know, they'll think about it on a regular basis after, you know, getting clean, um, you know, and it gets easier over time. And I think that's uh, where we're at. But like, I don't know, Bitcoin's kind of an interesting thing because like, you can you can go through that process without withdrawing 
essentially like switching off to a different standard preemptively before everything breaks and falls apart and you have to go through that hard withdrawal at least hopefully i don't know we will see but, yeah yeah i agree i think um you know the sooner you can adopt a bitcoin standard the better absolutely and i guess the people that we don't want to have bitcoin like socialists and communists like people that want to control others um and live off of others are probably going to be the last people to have bitcoin which i think is definitely a feature not a bug so perhaps you know things will be will be better in that sense that people that are actually creating value and creating wealth you know will have an easier time than the people that want to control and steal from others yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I back when I was younger, I didn't think I would ever get married. I didn't think I would ever get kid or have kids or want kids. And once I actually switched to like a Bitcoin standard, I began seeing like, oh, it's actually feasible for me to get an education. It's actually feasible for me to like start a family and have enough to make sure that they get the proper education. It's feasible for me to be able to get a house and live, you know, not saying like rich or anything, but live like pretty much the American dream, you know, and uh, Bitcoin really fixed that. And even in the so sovereign individual, the same chapter I was mentioning about the landowners generating yield, when they, you know, begin, began doing larger scale agriculture, it switched their time preference. They were originally thinking in one to three days and then being able to do larger scale operations, switch their time preference to one to three months. And I feel like, you know, when you have something you know is gonna be more valuable, you know, in the next four years, that completely changes your behavior and your incentives, like you were saying, uh, and what what you plan for in the future. So people that switch to a Bitcoin standard now will have a significantly easier time adapting to the future. Dude, I, I want all the socialists and commies to have Bitcoin. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, maybe, it, you know, maybe number go up technology will actually break their their mindset. Yeah, I or their mean, belief system, rather. Incentives are so powerful. Time preference is so powerful. And I think like a lot of people like fall into these ideas of socialism and communism just because of how awful the future looks and, and how awful the realities are right now. You know, you're presented with this idea that like you can have a sustainable or make like a realistic living. I mean, it's like the idea with the minimum wage where, you know, somebody's like barely scraping by like eight bucks an hour. 15 sounds like great, even though it's going to be extremely destructive in the long term. But that's why people like latch onto these ideas. And like if they have that same experience that you had, um, I think that's incredibly exciting. And it, it, it's like, I think like on top of it, like being feasible to like have a family and kids, it, it makes it more... I, it definitely shifted my idea around that potential. It, it makes it like, I, I think like one of the things that like dissuades people from wanting to bring kids into this world is they don't see a brighter future. And Bitcoin is that you know, like we can have a society and, and a future that isn't as corrupt and, and just awful as it is today. Um, yeah, 100% yeah, agree. Yeah, it's a really interesting way to put it that, you know, people turn to socialism and communism as like a, a coping mechanism for, you know, basically no hope for the future, whereas Bitcoin is actually hope. So uh, if they did receive Bitcoin, that might completely change their belief system and actually help them understand why increasing the minimum wage doesn't necessarily fix anything, especially when there's rapid inflation. It doesn't increase their cost, you know, their their uh, purchasing power by having a higher wage. Mm -hmm. In fact, it could do the exact opposite because everything has increased costs for labor now. So, yeah, that's a really great point that you made. Yeah. I, uh, I, I feel persuaded by that. I do want everyone to have Bitcoin now. <laughs> as soon as possible, it'll be better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's people that are, like, actually out to you know, hurt Bitcoin. Um, and maybe it'd be fair to say that you don't want people like that interacting with Bitcoin, especially like the scammers. Um, uh, but, you know, that's outside of our control. It's it's money that anybody can use and access. Um, but 
uh, I mean, it's just like you look at a lot of the, these people that really latch onto these socialist ideas and, um, you know, some of them, I, I mean, honestly, a lot of them are like, you know, wealthy, educated white people, which, you know, really, I, I shouldn't bring race into this because it doesn't matter, but it's like wealthy, educated people living in the suburbs, which I just do not understand um, that concept of why they would want socialism when things to a certain degree are, are working for them. Maybe, maybe they're over the ears and debt and it's just a facade where they're pretending to be wealthy, driving the Tesla and having the solar panels on your roof and whatever. Um, but, um, that, that is strange to me that, that concept. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people that fall into it, especially like the hardcore, uh, leftists, like when you look at like Antifa and Portland and stuff, these people like have probably experienced some like pretty awful situations to make them want to, to do this. Um, and to have the belief system they're, they're influenced by, you know, just, the worst things that happen to people in our society and there's a reason behind it um and i think you know seeing that there is you know a different way to go about things rather than um yeah this peaceful divorce and peaceful protest of of this injustice and awfulness and it actually promotes human freedom um is incredibly exciting 100 percent. definitely yeah i agree I think, you know, I think, you know, why probably the, uh, like the, the upper middle class or upper class signals all of those things like wanting to increase the minimum wage, to reallocate wealth, increase taxes, probably because one, they've never experienced, um, or read about what what communism has done and what socialism has done to the wealth of people. So that I think there's that. And then two, I feel like, you know, with social media, it incentivizes like kind of collectivist behavior and to like like eradicate individualism in the sense that you should be always doing what's best for you. So yeah, I, I think those are kind of two key factors. And then three, I think um You know they probably don't understand economics for one and um that's good for you know virtue signaling if you post about that kind of stuff on social media you'll get a ton of likes and you'll get a ton of um you know dopamine for posting stuff that you know the news has kind of said that hey this stuff is good and other people believe that it's good without understanding like the true implications yeah like the black and- the vaccine selfies yeah, exactly. Like you should not be posting private medical information online. You that should not be a regular conversation. You shouldn't be asking people if they have the vaccine or not. That's not appropriate. But you know, social media and also like peer validation, kind of like uh, testimonials. That's a way of influencing people and getting them to do what you want them to do. So, I I think like that stuff is ridiculous, and that's also why I don't really use social media other than Bitcoin, Twitter, often. Yeah, the idea of social media is like a tool to break down individualism. That I've never heard that before. That's really, really interesting. You see it like with this group think that is created on there. Where I mean, that's just something like where it's kind of built into us. So you have to work really hard to be willing to to wade into the water and go upstream against the current in our, our culture and society. And like you look back at history, the the most influential people freedom oriented people, you know, tended to be, there are some examples like Karl Marx that did that for, you know, not good reasons uh, or well, maybe he did it for good. Who knows what his motives were, but he, he created destructiveness. Um, but I mean, that's so incredibly important. And, and I think that as understanding history is really, really important, but yeah, I mean, I think these like rich liberals, I think like part of it, it, it is they feel like this, uh, that they need to have control uh, over other people and that people are, are supposed to be managed. We need to manage the people that are impoverished. We need to manage the homeless people. We need to have control over them and give them these things. And these are people to be manipulated and and shifted and changed rather than, um, you know, allowing for empowerment and, and, 
you know, cutting down barriers to entry. Like, you know, it's like, we're never going to be able to, um, like some people just enjoy being homeless. There's a lot of freedom that comes with it, you know, that yeah. be able to do what you want. And some people genuinely enjoy that. And we're never going to be able to impact that. But if you're able to like, uh, uh, you know, one part of homelessness that a lot of people don't talk about is a lot of these people have experienced a very catastrophic loss in their life. You know, having lost both parents, you know, growing up in foster homes, probably being abused, you know, which, you know, raises like the chance of like substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, that makes it a little bit more difficult or makes it a lot more difficult to, um, exist in, you know, traditional society. Like it, it you create, um, more stable environment with more stable money that people can actually save. And those things are lessened a lot. There's a lot less of that instability, you know? Um, and I think that's, you know, that's huge. Like it's ginormous, um, it has a major impact and it's, it's not about going and managing people and playing God in other people's lives. Like, I think that might play a part into it as well. Yeah, definitely. I think, a lot of people think that they're smarter than other people, you know, rather than being humble and realize there's something that you can learn from everybody uh, in all walks of life. It doesn't matter what your status is or anything like that or what your wealth is. There's always something you can learn from, you know, your neighbor, anyone around you. And it's up to you to be curious enough to find out what the thing is. And then two, you know, um, I think in general, uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I would say like you you have to be humble enough to to understand that there is something that you can learn from others. And uh, in terms of like the freedom aspect, yeah, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I don't know where I was going with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just. I mean, we all have the capacity to be evil and like to to do things, you know, they say that power corrupts, um, you know, which isn't always the case. I think there's good people in power, um, but it, it raises the potential for you to wield harm over other people. And I think like we, when we limit the, the power that we have over each other um, and make a conscious effort to do that, I think it, it really creates a better world. Um, and, you know, that's why freedom technologies are like Bitcoin are so, so incredibly important. Um, because it, it empowers the individual, it empowers, you know, people to make good decisions, to take control of their lives versus being reliant on third parties and, and on governments and, you know, on, on institutions that genuinely, and it's huge. No worries. So, um, uh, I agree. I, I, for example, like, you know, with the, what happened with the Silk Road, um, more freedom to be able to transact, you know, what, even if it was for quote unquote, like illicit substances, like we talked about this like a couple of weeks ago, like having the freedom to make the, your own decision on whether or not you want to take drugs should be absolutely indiv the individual's choice. It has no impact on like people around them other than themselves. I guess I shouldn't say no impact on the people around them, but I guess it should be really left up to the individual to choose and make that decision and deal with the consequences after the fact. And I, I remember where I was going earlier about that. It's like, you know, if you want to be homeless, you should be able to be homeless. And uh, I think like we focus so much on this idea of class and like redistributing wealth to make it equitable and fair across the board. Whereas like in reality, like if you're lower class and you create like a very valuable service or you gain very valuable skills, you can easily move up from the lower class to the middle class. And if you continue to make things more efficient, start your own company after gaining some skills and some experience, you can create even more wealth for yourself. And you should have the right to be able to do that. You shouldn't be taxing people to redistribute wealth that are not creating the appropriate value. Now, like when the fiat system, the odds are kind of stacked against you in order to make that happen because there's so many traps. Like student loans, in my opinion, are a complete trap. You don't really gain valuable skills that are useful in the real world from schools unless you're going to be like a lawyer or a doctor, as an example, you can learn most engineering, coding, uh, product management all online. I'm a product of that. I didn't graduate from high school. So I think like if you're lower class and you want to move up, then you should have the, the ability to do that. But if you're happy being lower class and you want to, you don't want to spend your time skilling up, spend your time working, then you should have the freedom to be able to do that. 
And I think Bitcoin fixes that problem because, you know, like if you're creating value, you're going to, you're going to get more value, which stats are value that, you know, are tied to a real world resource energy. So to me, like Bitcoin fixes the whole idea of equality and equity. It's like now it's a meritocracy. Now you're actually getting paid for the value that you created. And then this leads into the other point we were just talking about, which is the free market. Like, you know, 100 years ago, I don't think it was we required permission to start a business. Even in third world countries, you don't have permission to start a business. You don't need permission from the government to start a business. And I feel like that should be the same way. Like, I feel like there's so many regulatory moats around different industries and businesses that we should remove a lot of those things. People will self-regulate. People are pretty smart, like very smart. And like, for example, in food markets, like I was told, I was talking to someone at a Thai restaurant about going to Thailand and uh, they were like, yeah, just be careful of food. Make sure you pay attention to what the people are doing. Like if you see uh, like a food vendor on the street, they don't have any customers, don't eat there. That means it's bad food. It's like the, go to the places that have long lines because those are, that's what the market has selected. That's free market. Like you don't need, you know, like a health rating. You don't need permission from the government to go start up a food stand on the street. And you can look at other people's actions and behavior to get some sort of signal on like where you should go, where you should eat. And like, I feel like, you know, with, under a Bitcoin standard, having it set up to be such that if you want to move up classes, then you have that option by creating value for people. And the less, you know, steps that they need, less friction, like less steps and permission that they need, the better. And guess what? Bitcoin removes all the permission that you need from the state in order to like send and receive money. So I'm hoping that it will enable more free markets. And, uh, you know, going back to like the thing I said about the Silk Road, like, you know, I grew up in a horrible neighborhood and uh, I, there were lots of gangs, lots of drugs being uh, trafficked and sold. Uh, it's not bad anymore, uh, fortunately. But back then, like imagine like removing all the transactions face to face, just anonymous people transacting, like imagine how much violence that would reduce, how much risk that would reduce, how many like innocent bystanders, bystanders, bystanders being hurt. So to me, like, I think that the free market ultimately is the solution in many cases. Yeah. Well, you know, they say, you know why they call trap houses, trap houses, right? <laughs> no. Why do they call them that? Was it really difficult to leave? Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know why they called them trap houses, I don't but know why they called it that? But yeah, that's a joke I heard the other day. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's like, it, I mean, imagine like you can have a gang distributing drugs, or you can have your mailman distributing drugs. Which one do you think is safer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, look at with, you know, weed as an example, like, you know, weed back in the day, like you'd have to meet up with someone sketchy, you'd have to, you know, take on a risk of being robbed. And then you have no idea where this stuff came from. Like it could be contained with it could have been in the same smuggled in with bleach for all you know and be ter you could be inhaling bleach into your lungs and it's like with you know weed legalized now being able to get it from dispensaries in a recreational fashion at least in arizona it's like you can trust that you know probably wasn't smuggled in with bleach that they've you know somehow made it significantly safer to consume if you're eating like edibles or something like that it's in much smaller doses so people don't have really really bad experiences or feel sick from it so like to me it's like not only do you take it out of like the cartel's hands but you also like make it a lot safer to consume and more appropriate dosage where you know that wasn't really possible before it was just a bunch of random people winging it well i mean it's i mean that's it yes a great point and it kind of goes back to the idea of like a free market too because if they started putting crap in their pod you know people would wouldn't go there anymore hopefully um but yeah i mean fentanyl is like a huge issue it's a pretty common thing to see like somebody overdosed on the side of the road in tucson you know with the ambulance there um administering narcan and it's like if you can go and you can get clean heroin from a store if you're an addict like compared to like dealing with the sketchiness, potentially getting robbed, um, the violence around the distribution of the drug. It, I mean, it, it's just and and who gives anybody the the moral um, high ground to sit in 
dictate to somebody else what they can and can't do as long as they're not harming somebody, like physically harming somebody. Like, yeah, whose business is it? You know, it's like, yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, we're getting there though. We're moving in that direction. It's pretty exciting. Like the Silk Road is just, it's still around. You know, there's a thriving black market and this is all in response to this awful, you know, controls in, in the markets today. You know, this is just what's going to happen over and over again. Like, this is why we have Bitcoin. And yeah. But yeah, man. Um, love your story with like not um, going to school. We should have you back on sometime to talk about that. Um, got any plugs or anything you're excited about? Pretty excited. It's excited about Lightning. I'm excited to start work at Zebedee on Monday. Um, I hope to do great work there and put my heart and soul into it. I want to help Lightning scale. I want to help get more SATs to more people. So, uh, and just shout out to Arizona Bitcoin. If you're locally in Arizona, like check out our meetup. Like, I think how many people went last time? Like 40 people. It's a great scene. There's a lot of hardcore Bitcoiners. There's new coiners. So there's kind of different, you know, experience levels for, you know, whether you're brand new to Bitcoin, whether you're a new coiner that just recently bought their first Bitcoin, or you've been in Bitcoin for a few years now, you can kind of meet people uh, from every background, every skill level. And I would just say, yeah, please do check out Arizona Bitcoin. We, uh, the next meetup that you get, everyone's throwing is uh, June 23rd, right? I think so, yeah. So that those would be my my shameless shills is uh, Zebedee and and AZ Bitcoin. Super excited, and of course this wonderful podcast, You Sound Bitcoin. I love you know that we have such a great scene locally. So yeah, the scene like over the past year has just exploded. It's so exciting to see. Um, yeah, I mean Tucson, we're rolling, we're we're meeting. Um, yeah, Arizona Bitcoin Network is just like with what Steven started there. It's just so exciting. And I'm really excited to hear Kelly's presentation next week. So Kelly Lannan from Bitcoin, the creator of Bitcoin Urbanism is going to be presenting probably on Bitcoin ur- Urbanism. I'm not sure what, but, you know, the idea of like Bitcoin changing real estate um, is it, it's just such so awesome. He, he told me he's working on a book um, and I want to see that come out i'm just so stoked about that um but yeah i mean it is a great time it's like this is the revolution you know wait like for for people that are feeling demoralized and and powerless right now like bitcoin meetup is where it's happening we're changing things and creating a a brighter future you know we're helping people regain some semblance of like self-respect and and personal sovereignty in their lives and it's incredible um, so I love that you plugged it. And then uh, Zebedee.io is the website, I believe. Yep. And it's Z-E-B-E-D-E-E.io. Yeah. It, I, I was having trouble when I was uh, putting it in the search engine, finding it. It throws you like a million things. Um, so having the URLs happy or uh, helpful, 100%. Definitely agree. So yeah, definitely excited about Kelly's talk too. I read, I heard, I listened to his podcast on Tales from the Crypt and uh, I connected with him on LinkedIn. He was actually the one that told me about Arizona Bitcoin because I thought about starting my own meetup. Uh, and he was like, no, man, there's already one going. So, you know, I went to the second meetup that AZ Bitcoin hosted and you guys were all awesome. I'm like, so excited that we have this available for us. And if you haven't checked out Kelly's stuff, definitely check his stuff out too. You have, I think you have some podcast episodes with him for sure. So listen to what he's about. I mean, when I started thinking about the impact that Sound Money has on architectural standards and development, like you were saying, it was pretty mind blowing because I had never considered that, you know, like the, the fiat buildings that we have today compared to like, you know, in our gilded age, like the, the difference is staggering. If you look at old buildings from New York compared to like newer buildings today, you can tell like there's significantly less standards in terms of elegance and design. And Kelly gets into all of that. So it's, I'm super excited and pumped for his chat too, or his talk. Yeah. Fiat architecture is really shitty. I think that's a better argument than uh Saifedean's fiat art one but fiat art's pretty bad too to be honest yeah yeah it is it could just feel like a 
Um, it's a single uh, brush stroke on a painting. Sell for millions. It's ridiculous. Compare a Sist the Sistine Chapel to an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not even remotely. Yeah. Those JPEGs are selling for millions of dollars. Like Sistine <laughs> Chapel's like priceless. Like it's never going to be able to replicate it. it. It is truly unique. And just the amount of time and effort that it took to do that versus just creating this little, I don't know. It, it, I, I, I looked, was looking at them a couple months ago and it's just like, what on earth are people thinking? Like, but yeah, to each their own, I guess. It, it won't last. Agree. Like worse than Beanie Babies. But yeah, what's yeah, your- hey. What's your Twitter account? It's uh so it's Santos Hernandez, but with the five in front instead of the first S. So it's five Antos Hernandez. I'll link it. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Alex. I, I really appreciate you having me on, man. It was a pleasure chatting with you. I'm honored to be here. Definitely. That was a really good conversation with Santos. And every time I talk with him, I just feel like I can talk with him for hours uh, because he's just got great outlooks on things and great conversationalist and nothing but good things to say about him. Really glad he's a part of the Arizona Bitcoin scene. And we, we have a cool community and it is growing. And I'm really excited about the upcoming meetups in Tucson and Phoenix in Tucson. I believe it's on the 17th and no, it's on the 19th, I believe. It's a Saturday coming up and then uh, the 23rd in Phoenix, which is a Wednesday night and Kelly Lannon will be presenting. Uh, not sure what on, probably Bitcoin nervousism, but I'm pretty stoked on that. It's going to be awesome. Just super, super bullish. We're working on all sorts of cool things. Uh, we got some stuff with the Lightning Network in the works. If you want to open up a channel, get some you know liquidity to your node, uh, meetups are a great place to meet people and uh to talk about that stuff you know we want to build a robust lightning network uh connection of nodes all across arizona uh to make it easy if somebody wants to hop onto a btc pay server or something like that to be able to easily receive funds and, and not have the headache of having to manage a million channels with a million other nodes and to really take self-sovereignty into their own hands uh, but yeah, super, super stoked. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.